Good morning, and welcome to a very special edition of More Money Minutes for Doctors. I'm your host, Catherine Vesnes. I'm also the CEO and founder of MD Financial Advisors. And today is a very special day because we're going to be talking about the nine mistakes doctors make when they're either starting or buying a practice. And it's a special day because I have two of my dear friends, colleagues, and excellent uh, sources of information for doctors. Attorney Brett Larson, who is actually happens to be my attorney too. We work together at Mezzaline Kramer, and we also have Rob Borcherding with us. Rob is at Wells Fargo, and he works with, I don't know, dozens and dozens of doctors in helping them finance their practice. So gentlemen, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Morning, thank you. So as I mentioned, our topic is the nine mistakes doctors make when starting or buying a practice and of course, how to avoid them. So I'm gonna start with Rob first. Tell us a little bit about you and how you help doctors and then we'll get into those top three mistakes that you see doctors making. Sure, yeah, thanks Catherine. So basically I'm the business development manager of the practice finance division of Wells Fargo here for the upper Midwest. So our division is devoted to private practice, pro, uh, private practices period, right? Whether that be starting, acquiring, expanding. Uh, we do help a little bit with uh, giving doctors some resources and support with transitioning. However, I always finance the buyers. So the sellers aren't always my client, but we've been around for 30 years uh, lending to doctors and helping them venture into that entrepreneurial side of healthcare. So, we have a wealth of experience. We have a ton of resources. And my job is to specifically support and, and inspire people to become practice owners. And one of the things I like working with you and why we send our clients your way is you really take good care of them. You really help them build business plans and provide coaching and other support for them. Yep, absolutely. Um, I mean, obviously, when we're helping people venture into practice ownership, it's not just about the loan. It's also about how we give you resources and support to run a successful practice and how that's set up. Um, again, whether you're starting or buying your first practice, you're not probably that adept in, in all the things that go into running a business. So you don't need to be, uh, frankly. That's why there's people like all of us here on this call today are here. Uh, and, and that's why the real, real point is to help somebody do it correctly and then run a successful practice. So then well, our loan gets paid and, and they grow their family and their professional career. Yeah, that's definitely the end goal. Well, let's tell us, what do you see as the top three mistakes you see doctors making in this area? Sure, absolutely. And I'm going to share my screen here just because, you know, I prepared a little uh, visual for people. So I hope that you could see that. So, so yeah, well, first of all, um, you know, when I look at that, I really see three common mistakes, right? So, the first thing is just, it's all about the preparation. It's all about kind of what you do beforehand. So number one is, is interviewing and selecting a team, right? Because whether you're acquiring or buying into a practice or whether you're going to start a practice, you're going to need a, a core group of people, which is always going to be an attorney, you know, a CPA. And then there's various types of insurances that you're going to need when you, when you buy or start a practice. So you know, let's just say you're, you're interested in being a practice owner and then you come across this practice and well, the seller wants to sell. So just like buying a house, like, oh shoot, you got to scramble and get a realtor. It, you know, you got to make sure it's priced adequately. So it's really important to do this as soon as you feel like you want to be a practice owner and to set up your team. And your team is always going to be, your core group is always your attorney, CPA, and insurance advisor, right? Slash financial planner, right? Um, if you're, if you're going to start a practice, then, I mean, having an idea on what construction costs might be, um, having an idea of what type of equipment you're going to want to put in, and then just like buying a house, you know, having a realtor, right? Having a commercial realtor that knows what the uh, expense or the, 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 the going rate is for, for any side of space or if you're looking to purchase a building. So when you do this earlier, that means that you're set up to repeat this if you find a practice that's for sale or you find a location that might be a viable location to start your practice. So that's the first thing is then just get to know people, interview them and really put them on that, that team that centers around you. Um, so that's the, the first one. The second one I would say, and, and this is in no specific order, but the second one is, is preparing your personal financials and understanding 
the pre-qualifications that goes into private practice limit. Um, I always say this to, when I present to students, you picked a great industry. If you're, if you're a dentist, veterinarian, optometrist, you know, even private medical uh, professional. My dad started and ran a civil engineering land surveying company in Rochester back in the 70s. I tell him what we do for doctors and he's like, what, how does this lending work? Like, oh my gosh, you don't have to put money down. So, so practice lending, when you deal with a practice lender that does this exclusively, we have faith and confidence and data and, and history in lending to these industries. And we know the risks and how to do it correctly. Therefore, less money down, if any money down at all, and you know, better rates, longer fixed, fixed term rates. So you, I get this question a lot of times, do I need to put money down? You know, what do I need to do, right? And they do it at the last minute. So the more you understand that beforehand, the, no, the more you understand how to prepare student debt, as an example. People come out of dental school or, 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 or medical school and say, oh my gosh, I need to pay my student loans off fast. Well, that may not necessarily help you when you're ready to buy a practice. So it's important to have this conversation with somebody who can help you put a student loan debt repayment strategy in place, being a practice owner. Um, liquidity, right? Like how much money do I need to save? Well, that depends on the type of practice you want to start or acquire. So it's important to understand that. Um, and then of course, like associating or, or leadership or, or just your resume, right? What's what your experience is. So that's there are various things depending on the type of practice you want to start or acquire that it's important to understand those going in. Um, the third thing, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a business major, right? I've wrote countless sample business plans and, and done case studies. Um, not every doctor does this. So if you're going to venture into business ownership, I think it's smart for you to just understand what goes into a business plan, things that you should think about um, to put together. Now, you don't need to write a full business plan if you don't know what practice you're going to buy or where you're going to start, but just understanding the general concepts of marketing, understanding your what your clinical philosophies want to be, what your vision is going to be of the type of practice you want to own or start. Just having some, some just, you know, pre-work done on this is, is the third thing that I would highly recommend for people to look into. Well, awesome. I really agree with everything that you said, Rob. Uh, student debt, as you know, that's one of the things our firm does is we do work on student debt either reduction plans, because we want doctors to get out of debt eventually, yep. and how to best do that. I was very impressed the last time we chatted with how much of your loans to doctors are, they're unsecured a lot of times. And the, the, I was surprised with the interest rates. Can you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. And, and so first of all, like practice lending in general is always typically 10 year fixed rates. And, and right now, I mean, rates are historically low. If you haven't refinanced your house, please refinance your house, as you know. But yeah, so so this is, it's a great time from a lending perspective to, to quote unquote, borrow money. So so yeah, rates are in the, you know, they could be in the threes, they could be in the high twos, they could be in the fours, it's case by case, but it's historically an amazing time. And then practice lenders don't take personal collateral as collateral, right? We, we do a loan to the practice, so, I mean, well, technically, I guess our collateral is your equipment, but, you know, if you're buying a practice for $800,000, we are not going to get $800,000 back from the equipment. So there's a lot of, you know, blue sky, as we call it. But, but yeah, those are the two basic components where it's all about the doctor's ability to produce and to run a successful practice. That's essentially our collateral. Well, let's move on to, as I said, my own personal attorney, attorney extraordinaire, Brett Larson. Brett and I have worked together for a number of years. We've worked with many, many doctors together. And I love Brett's approach. Um, one of the things I'll say about him, he's an absolutely brilliant negotiator. And I love watching you work. So as, as Catherine said, you know, my practice is primarily general corporate and merger and acquisition with a focus in medical and medical practice. And we represent both buyers and sellers of, of medical practices. And we're able to leverage that experience and, and knowledge uh, that we gain in terms of uh, infra value drivers and value detractors in order to help uh, advise our, our, our practice owner clients in terms of best practices to de-risk their business, uh, which, which tend to be the things that drive value uh, when you get to an M&A event. So in terms of the, the three um, 
the, the three mistakes or, or issues that, that, that I want to focus on sort of chronologically going through the process, right? Um, once you've decided to leave your, your current employer or your current position and, and start a, a practice of your own, uh, first, make sure that that's a, a thoughtful and smooth process as much as possible that doesn't create any additional risk of lawsuit. So the things to focus on specifically, you know, pull out your employment agreement that you probably haven't looked at since you started your position and, and hire an attorney or make sure you understand your non-compete and your non-solicit obligations. Now, there are the non-compete, non-solicit obligations that are written in the contract. And then the, then the next question is, based on where you're located and, and in your area of practice and your specialty, how enforceable are those restrictive covenants? And, and the next uh, thing to think about once you really understand sort of the, uh, the enforceability of, of those restrictive covenants is your communication and marketing plan initially when you, when you initially leave. Uh, in light of those restrictive covenants and the continuity of care obligations that, that, that you have as a, as a treating physician and that, and that your employer has as well, uh, regardless of uh, what those restrictive covenants are, uh, those ethical obligations are going to modify those restrictive covenants. So once you've decided on that you're going to leave your current employer and how you're going to leave and how you're going to uh, communicate uh, to, you know, to your patient uh, population initially, uh, the next thing to really focus on is similar to something that, that Rob uh, touched on. Uh, first, you know, make sure you're focusing on drivers of consistent revenue cycles. So when putting your team together, really focus on you know, good collection and billing practices and making sure that you're creating predictive, predictable revenue cycles. And, and as much as you can professionalize this portion of your practice, that, that, that one component of your practice uh, will be either a value driver or detractor. Many times when we start the sort of the process of deciding if we're going to market a practice for sale, how much the price is going to be, or on the other side, if we're representing a private equity firm, in buying those practices, one of the first things we look at is uh, in, in the quality of earnings analysis is the revenue cycle and, and how, uh, how efficient uh, those collection and billing practices are. And so um, focus on that uh, at the outset. And there are plenty of billing, uh, medical billing firms that you could outsource much of that to. And I'm sure um, Rob has worked with many of them and, and could probably give some good pointers in terms of uh, those firms that are uh, that, that do a good job. The next thing is uh, making sure that your highly profitable employees, whether they're mid levels or other or, or other positions, have good enforceable non competes and non solicit obligations. So sort of the the flip side of you know the 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 analysis that you want to go through when deciding to leave your employer, you want to make sure that you've created um, the fair but appropriate. Uh, restrictions on competition so that if you have uh, mid-levels, for instance, who are um, who, who have a lot of patient interaction that they're not able to go across the street and, and take uh, a large percentage of your patient population with them. Um, and, and then the, the third thing is really contracts, focusing on the, the contracts that you enter into, whether they're the third party payer contracts or even your leases or um, equipment leases. Uh, those tend to be the, the main sort of uh, contracts in terms of um, dollars expense uh, that you'll enter into. And you wanna make sure that those have you know, market terms and that they're freely assignable to the extent that a buyer would want to, would want to uh, take an assignment of them. Uh, and and you're, you can have an attorney review those things just to make sure that you have, um, that you have as much autonomy and kind of control over what might happen with those contracts going through a transaction as, as you can possibly have. And then the, the third item that I think um, is worth focusing on is if, if you are going to go into a practice with multiple owners, alignment is really important. And alignment in terms of compensation and, and governance is, is very important. And it's important to think about where the different owners are in terms of their career path, right? Um, going back to, you know, the event of a sale, uh, in, in most of those cir circumstances, part of that purchase price is really going to be financed by 
the doctors taking a lower salary going forward. And so if everybody is at about the same point in their career in terms of ownership, that tends to work better and, and there's less tension. Uh, if, if though we have some doctors who are planning on retiring a year after the sale and some who are planning on working for another 25 years, you, you just don't have that, that natural alignment. Uh, and so it's, it's something to think about and, and, and draft around in your, in your buy sell uh, and compensation plan uh, if needed. And then also other things to think about when, when putting that, that, uh, that buy sell agreement in place is a drag along tag along to make sure that if a majority of the owners want to sell or enter into a, some, some sort of other transaction where maybe you sell off a portion of the equity to uh, you know, to a hospital group, uh, you're able to do that with less than a unanimous consent of, of all of the owners. And then um, finally, uh, make sure that you have a good buy-sell agreement in place and that you have a mechanism for financing that buy-sell, whether it be life insurance uh, to finance a, a purchase on, on death, or if uh, you have a mandatory buyout or a permissive buyout when, when one of the doctors leaves their employment, um, you, you'll want to talk to somebody like Rob about how you can finance that so that you don't have to pay for all of that, that buyout out of the revenue of the uh, practice. Well, I just want to add a couple of things to that. I'm amazed at how many of our clients will sign a lease or some other legal document without having an attorney review it. And there's almost always some gotcha there because it's not going to be written to benefit <laughs> that, that doctor. So I can't uh, affirm enough what, uh, what Brett's saying about have an attorney re review them. And I just want to comment, you were talking about this. We had a joint case um, a couple years ago in the Twin City where a big group was being bought out. And this turned into a disaster. Both Brett and I said, don't sell, don't sell, don't sell. You're really going to regret this. And of course, they went ahead and sold. And you, you're right. It was a, let's talk a little bit about who really came out ahead in that and who, who was really hurt. Because sure enough, within a year, they're all going, why did we do this? This was really a disaster. So you want to can share a little bit on that. Yeah, it was it was sort of the a great a great example of how uh, of, of tension between a, a private equity run business and a medical practice, right? A, pro, a, a professional medical practice, and there was a, a great degree of tension in terms of how manage how decisions were being made, and, and we could kind of see that as we were going through the deal and and knew that that was going to create a lot of tension for the doctors who were going to continue to be in management and continue to practice practice there. And so, you know, initially there's a, you know, a decent amount of cash that will come out of the deal, right? For each of the doctors. Mm -hmm. And uh, in part to finance that on the back end, the, the, the buyer will, will ask that the doctors agree to a five-year, typically a five-year employment agreement, right? And typically that, that salary for compensation is at a, at a lower level than what they've been making right. historically. So in essence, they're financing their own buyout, right? right? So we really need to go through the economics and uh, you know at least a five year window in terms of what am I really taking out of this deal? What is my net when taking into account the part of it that I'm really financing by taking lower compensation? And we go through that and help them figure out what's your really net, what's your after tax right. net? Right after accounting for what you would pay in, a, you know, an ordinary income on that salary over that five-year period, and then, you know, what what you're paying in capital gains taxes uh, in the transaction, and you know that group of physicians, I think there were 25 owners or so, right. and they really ranged in age between, you know, mid 60s down to you know low to mid 40s, and there was a lot of tension between. Uh, between the doctors at either end of the spectrum in terms of how many years they were going to continue to practice because for those that were going to retire within a year, that reduced salary over that one year period, not that big of a deal, right? But for those people who were going to continue to practice for another 15 to 20 years, they were going to make it through that five-year window and then some or have to go find employment elsewhere, it, it was a lot more expensive for them to, to do the deal. And that was one of the main reasons I think that um, that there was some tension at the very outset in deciding how to move forward, which is part of my point about alignment, making sure that everybody sort of is aligned in their short-term, mid-term, long-term goals so that you don't find yourself in that circumstance when 
when when some people want to sell the sell the practice and, and others uh, are just not um, uh, not aligned with that decision. Right. And I have to say that pay cut, if I remember correctly, was like a 20 to 25 percent pay cut. So it was pretty substantial. Okay. And you're right, they, some of those doctors couldn't get it through their head that that's how they were financing. They, sure, they got a lump sum up front, but that's how they're financing the deal is off of their own salary. So anyway, I'm a yeah. lesson for those doctors. It was. And, and, you know, going through that part of the process, right, if, if the, the idea is that the practice is going to pay me less going forward, well, that means necessarily they've, it's been overpaying me in the past which should mean an add back to EBITDA, which should mean that my purchase price goes up by a multiple of six to eight. So, you know, that's something, it, there, there are two sides of that coin, right? And again, if I'm going to be, you know, retiring within a short period of time, I can use that, that decreased salary to justify a higher purchase price. But you need to have people on your team that, 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 that know that and, and think that way. So do you want to comment a little bit about how they can negotiate for getting that patient list. Yeah, typically that's going to be on the front end in, in your employment agreement. And the way to position that ask is through a continu continuity of care uh, obligation that the, the, the employer has and the employee has, right? And so the, the best way to, to really manage that process is to agree at the very beginning of the employment relationship when, every, when everything's positive that if we should separate and go our separate ways, we're going to send out a joint letter and, ex and explain where I'm going, where the practice is, give, give the address, give the contact information so that, so that the patient can decide you know, how they want to continue to right. you know, receive care. Um, there's a HIPAA issue as well that, that you may or may not need to navigate around depending on your practice area. So if you're if you're an oncologist, for example, right, necessarily means that most of you, the people on your patient list probably have a specific type of um, medical issue, right? So the, your inclusion on the list in and of itself could be deemed HIPAA protected information. Now, if you're a general practitioner or a dermatologist or, and you're just, your general inclusion on the list doesn't necessarily connote a specific medical uh, diagnosis, well, then that, that list may or may not be treated as, as HIPAA protected information. So just another consideration when, when kind of navigating through that process. Awesome. Well, I'm going to take on the last three mistakes. As I mentioned before, I'm the CEO and founder of MD Financial Advisors. We're a concierge financial planning firm for over 500 doctors from Hawaii to Cape Cod. And we really do anything that has to do with finances, including coordinating with these excellent uh, sources of advisors for our clients. We kind of see ourselves as the quarterback and managing these teams that Rob talked about earlier. So I do wanna talk about the three mistakes that we see doctors make when it comes to buying or a starting a brand new practice. Um, I call this, they don't really look at the big overall picture financially or what we call counting the costs. They haven't looked at all the expenses, what it's gonna take for them to get this started. Because we know it can take many, many months to get approved by insurance companies, to get paid, and there's a long lag time. How are they gonna support themselves and their family during that time period? And are they gonna to need to be taking money out of their current investments or maybe even their retirement funds to be able to finance this new venture? And how is that gonna impact your retirement? Because obviously if they're spending the money now, you're not gonna be having it, having it later or this might even impact your children's education. So we wanna take a look and try to pull all of this together. How is this gonna work? If we're planning to sell the practice in the future, what do we estimate we think we can get? How is that gonna impact uh, your future for yourself and your family? Now, second thing we like to look at is getting excellent retirement plans. I'm amazed at how many doctors have these very basic SEP IRAs. Sure, that's a nice thing, for them, but they can't put enough money into that. There's some marvelous things that we can do with retirement plans to save taxes for now and also help um, have a much more robust retirement. So obviously we wanna put in a 401k whenever we can. Yes, that does mean the doctor is going to have to be contributing some money to each of those um, employees. 
but overall you're going to be the big winner with a 401k once again we run numbers and we may not do it the first year you're in practice we want to make sure that you've got a good substantial start and then we can implement that so a great way for you to save taxes also a big draw we think for hiring the right staff now something else we like to do in the right case is something called a defined benefit plan this is an additional retirement plan that we can layer on top of a 401k. Once again, you can save more money in taxes now, have more tax advantaged funds for retirement later. It doesn't work in all cases, but it's something that we wanna take a look at and see if it's gonna fit for you. And then finally, I would say, I think doctors in my opinion are not usually born entrepreneurs. They, um, I in fact, started one of my first businesses when I was 12. And I've been doing this for many, many years. I'm definitely the serial entrepreneur. But a lot of doctors have not started a business. So very often I will suggest before you go out on your own, why don't you work for a little bit in a smaller private practice just to get a feel of what it's like to hire that staff. Um, deal with the day-to-day -day issues of billing and the other things that you have to work with. And negotiating with landlords. All of that is important information that you can have first under your belt before you launch on your own. Or it's, you can also get a very experienced practice management or business coach. You probably need a mentor, somebody to help you get through this stage. So those are the things I was gonna suggest. And then for a summary today, so I'm gonna let um, Rob, what is your takeaway or how would you like to summarize for today? Oh, well, you know, I would just say if you're a doctor and you have visions of running your own practice, I think your takeaway is anything's possible. Right, you have you have resources like the three of us. You have other mentors. You're not reinventing the wheel. People have been doing it for decades. Um, and any doctor that wants to take advantage of uh, uh, owning a practice, you can absolutely do it. Um, you know, Brett talked about corporate consolidation and private equity in that example. I mean, we could have a whole another hour, two hour seminar on that. And I'll just say this, there's a reason why private equity is getting into these industries that we support, dental, veterinarian, optometry, private medical, right? I always call doctors LeBron James. You are the most valuable player on the court at all times. Just imagine, you, you know how much revenue LeBron James creates for the NBA. So now just imagine if you own the team and you were LeBron James, right? Mm -hmm. so that's, that's the capabilities that a doctor has. Um, if they have that entrepreneurial bug. And again, we're all here to support that entrepreneurial entrepreneurial bug if they if they so choose to move that forward. That's what I would say. I love that analogy of being LeBron James and owning the team because that's so, so true. So I mean, Brooke, for real. Yeah. What, what kind of summary or last thoughts do you have? Yeah, I'll piggyback on, on Rob's uh, analogy. Even LeBron as a coach, right? <laughs> And, and he has a team around him, right? He can't play every position. So make sure that you have the right group of people around you and that you're, you're leveraging the information that they have and, and the resources that they have, right? Working with somebody like Rob to help you, you know, put the business plan together um, and in a way that, that aligns the bank and a lot of the due diligence and a lot of this, you know, decisions that they're helping you make um along the way is going to help you avoid learning things the hard way that others have had to learn the hard way and going through some of the best practices that i've outlined um i think you'll be well ahead of most of the 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 doctors that we help sell their practice so you know if, if you can start thinking about these things early and often and professionalize the practice then you can really focus on practicing medicine and and let the business kind of run itself, assuming that you have the right group of people around you to help you do so. Oh, well stated, so agree with that. Um, I just wanna say, when I think about all of our doctors that own their own practice versus a, you know, a lot of our clients, of course, are W-2 employees of some other hospital or clinic. The happiest doctors are the ones that own their own practice. They, life is better for them. They like being able to call the shots, they like uh, having control over their life and they're, they're just happy and I feel like they can work longer. So if you're a doctor who's thinking about taking the plunge, I would really encourage you to get this team around you and let's see if we can make it happen because I think life is gonna be better for you. 
So Brett and Rob, I want to thank you for joining me today. I'm going to have your contact information in our show notes in case anybody would like to reach out to you directly. And if uh, the idea of doing another seminar about having private equity, maybe buying a practice or how that might impact you is something that's of interest to you, please just email us at info at mdfinancialadvisors.com. And I think we'd be happy to do that in the future. So let us know. All right. So take care and good luck to all of our doctorpreneurs out there.